And just quickly about Start of Vancouver is what our why is and the purpose of what we do and why we do it. So we are a volunteer based group of entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs, and we have two core values of pillars. And the first one is to collaborate, not to compete. And we do this by supporting all the events and, and uh, other initiatives across the province and across Vancouver. Oops, looks like I lost my slide deck there. Pauline, maybe you can pull that back. Thank you very much. And speaking of collaboration, tonight this impactful event would not happen without the generous support of our presenting sponsors. So we have Futurepreneur Canada and Van City as our, our presenting sponsors here this evening. And we're gonna have both Pauline Norris from Futurepreneur and also uh, Pauline, uh, uh, I'm sorry, did I say Pauline? I meant Joanne Norris, excuse me, Joanne Norris from Future. Canada and also Joanne Stone Campbell from Van City to say a few words of the impactful work that they're doing with Indigenous communities and entrepreneurship and business across the country and especially on the West Coast. And we also have our supporting sponsors, KPU School of Business, MasterCard Canada, SFU Venture Labs, which continues to be a great in-kind supporting sponsor to the, do all the behind the scenes work that make the technical magic happen here this evening. And also our good friends at Startup Canada nationally that also have supported this to turn this truly into a national event. And our other core value in our guiding light is, uh, is we make entrepreneurship welcoming and inviting for everyone. So that diversity and inclusion piece of doing our best to create these programs and these events that make entrepreneurship welcoming and inviting for everyone, no matter gender, age, sexual orientation, your as far as your, your, your ethnic background, uh, and tech and non-tech, we support everybody. And an event like this with Can Startup Stories is just one small way that we like to walk that walk and do that. And in the past, as I mentioned earlier, we've done over a dozen in-venue van startup stories from, as you can see here, one example here of celebrating LBGTQ entrepreneurs. And last year, we actually had the, uh, the honor and the privilege of celebrating Indigenous entrepreneurs last July. So this is the second time we've had the opportunity to showcase some amazing, diverse Indigenous entrepreneurs. And you're going to hear from five of them this evening. As you can see there, I'm going to leave it to my co-host and our MC tonight, Nicole McLaren, to, to expand upon uh, who we're going to be hearing from this evening. And, oh, you kind of went a little bit too far there, Pauline, if you can just pop back there for a second. I know, it seems like I was inter introducing Nicole there. I wasn't quite done. I was going to introduce her in a second. There we go. We just go back there for uh, for a moment. to the deck that I just had. Pauline, you're able to pull that one back up here? There we go. All right. So I also quickly wanted to mention here that we at the recording here this evening and all of the other Can Startup Stories events that we have held, we do record them and that we do post them on our YouTube channel. So if you wanted to go back and watch this later or if you want to recommend it to some friends, please do that through our Startup Vancouver YouTube channel. This is meant to be a, an interactive and engaging two hours of conversation. So our five diverse entrepreneurs will be presenting for about 12, 13 minutes each. And then we're going to open it up for a Q&A of two or three minutes, uh, which Nicole is going to lead. But then we're going to open it up to the audience. So all attendees, whether in chat or Q&A, uh, everybody out there, please ask some questions because we want to make this as vibrant and rich as possible this evening. And also, we're very active uh, on social media. As I mentioned, if you are if you are interested in that type of thing and you want to then post in real time, as I'm going to be doing here, please use the hashtag Can Startup Stories because the more we do that, the more value we're going to give uh, for our five wonderful speakers here and be able to amplify their signal and give them even more benefit and value here this evening. So again, my name is Colin Weston, Startup Vancouver Community Leader. You can reach me there if, if you would like to contact me for, uh, to find out more about what we do and why we do it with Startup Vancouver. And as I mentioned now, I would like to turn it over to 
my co-host and our MC for this evening, Nicole McLaren, who is the CEO and founder of Raven Reads Books and is also the 2018 winner, the recipient of the Startup Canada Indigenous Entrepreneur of the Year Award. She's won many other awards which, that she's very deserving of. So Nicole, welcome. Thank you for joining me this evening and I wanna hand it over to you, please. Great, thank you, Colin. Uh, Tansi, my name is Nicole McLaren and I'm the founder and CEO of Raven Reads Books and founder of the Indigenous Women's Business Network. Raven Reads is an Indigenous subscription box, publishing house, and wholesale gift line that delivers quality and award-winning Indigenous content to subscribers around the world. I'm also a Métis Cree mixed European ancestry mother and wife from BC and Northern Saskatchewan. And I really just wanna thank you all for attending uh, the 2020 Can Startup Stories Celebrating Indigenous Entrepreneurs speaker event this evening. Now, we, before we begin, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that Startup Vancouver is an honored guest on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam nations. And I'm personally located in the traditional and unceded territory of the Interior Salish and Plakama Nation. So we have an incredible lineup of storytellers and successful entrepreneurs tonight, and I can't wait to hear from them and, uh, and engage in some questions and answers from the audience. Before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to remind all of our speakers to please try to keep your speaking time to around 12 to 14 minutes. And that's just to allow us some adequate time for questions and answers and make sure everybody gets, gets a bit of uh, time to speak. So our first speaker tonight is Lucy Sager. She's the CEO of All Nations Driving Academy. All Nations Driving Academy was founded in 2018 in direct response to the needs and requests for driver training by community leadership and their membership. All Nation Driving Academy works to deliver curriculum and program programming in partnership with First Nations that are flexible to meet membership needs. Working to make a difference not only in First Nations as well as along the Highway of Tears in Northern BC, Lucy earned her MBA from UNBC in 2013 and she currently resides in Victoria along with her two sons. Lucy, welcome. And please tell us more all about All Nations Driving Academy and the excellent work that you're doing. Yeah, thank you for having me, Nicole. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to, to share tonight. So All Nations Driving Academy, um, a little bit about my background is my Indigenous background is Cherokee. So originally from the United States, actually, and my parents came to Canada on a grand adventure and worked a lot with the Simshin and Nishka Nations. So growing up along the Highway of Tears um, for a long time, you know, I've lived this story of people disappearing that I knew, but also um, as an adult then working in construction around the topic of major projects in oil and gas and mining and working to negotiate impact benefit agreements around employment and procurement. And so after quite a few years of sitting with um, chief and counsel and asking what are the barriers to people going to work time and time again, a driver's license came up and I thought, well, we can't train for plumbing if we um, need a driver's license. So I went back to school and wrapped my truck and wrote the graduated license, license curriculum that is um, endorsed by ICBC. So it allows you to have high school credits and shorten the end. And we did this business like a little bit of a different model where it was almost like a franchise, but not quite where we would teach Indigenous communities how to have their own driving school. Um, so this is a little bit of that story. So this is an example of a job posting that we see, and this is actually for a baker. Um, so, you know, valid driver's license with a safe and five-year, um, you know, non-commercial driving abstract. So not only do you need a driver's license, but you need it for five years. So we were just seeing this trend on and on, you know, when people were promising jobs and then what were the challenges to fulfilling those jobs. Early on in our, our company's history, so I'm only two and a half years old, um, but the Heisla First Nation called and said, Lucy, can you please get in here and, and help us set up our driving school? And this is a picture from their grand opening and just an example. So 
you know, for the better part of an afternoon, we just had groups and groups of people signing up for driver training. And it was really interesting to me to kind of see these trends in Indigenous communities and, and think about, you know, it's really fascinating that so many people needed needed a driver's license. Um, so again, early on in, in, my pro, in my project, in my company, um, was the story of Jessica Patrick disappearing out of Smithers. And I remember working in Witset and having to let everyone out of class to go to her memorial service and just how upsetting that was to me, knowing that this is a narrative that we keep telling. And in my work along the Highway of Tears, um, our most recent woman who went missing was actually out of Haida Gwaii, which is mile zero of the Highway of Tears. And that happened this past March. And so how much does driver's licensing um, play uh, play a narrative in that story or, or play a key role in that story? Um, one of the beautiful things I didn't expect was kind of the age range of people that we would see participating in driver training. And this is a good friend of mine and he was so proud. He said, Lucy, you have to take my picture. And this is the first time he ever drove himself out of his community. Um, and I, I just remember thinking the significance of that. And he said to me, um, Lucy, you're the first person to ever trust me to do this. And I said, no, I'm the second. You're the first person to ever trust yourself. And so that was a really beautiful dialogue and just the conversation of him wishing that his dad um, could see him and in all the, the good decisions he was making in his life and being able to drive a car. Many of the remote communities that I work with are on islands along the coast of British Columbia. And so driving isn't something that people grew up with. And in many cases, roads uh, did not exist. And so lots of transportation around boats, but not so much around cars. So um, again and again, you know, seeing some different trends and, and having elders come to class and I wanted to understand what was different about this and what was going on. And this, this quote um, came to my attention and it really resonated with me. So if you don't understand the underlying need, nothing else will matter. People will not share their innermost needs unless they feel safe, respected and accepted for who they are. And so what happened was the elders sat me down and they said, Lucy, you need to understand that this is actually our first memory of going to residential school was being taken in a car. And so if we think about the 60s scoop and being taken in a car and child apprehension today um, of being taken in a car, there's a lot of trauma around the car. And this is not specific to British Columbia. Um, we see this in Australia and New Zealand as well. And so um, the elders could, could share with me that um, they didn't have the skills to teach their kids how to drive. And it wasn't that they didn't want to. So if we look at uh, Haida Gwaii, there's no driving school. So communities can't hire someone even if they wanted to. Or uh, west of Port Alberni, there's, there's nothing. And so that was really, um, that, that was a real aha moment for me. And, and I loved that the elders are coming and we see three generations of people sitting and learning together you know, the, the alternative is unlicensed driving. And so what happens if you get caught, it's called driving while prohibited. And if you get caught twice, um, it's actually mandatory 14 days in jail and a criminal record. And so if we were then to go um, talk about over incarceration of Indigenous people, this has actually pulled me into the Attorney General's office to do some consulting um, around Indigenous justice policy and the decisions that we're making. So uh, th this was a bit of an accidental um, business, if you will, and, and I didn't find what I expected to find. One of the things that we do in our driver training classes, it doesn't matter what age, is we do a mental health check-in. So how are you feeling? Are you happy? Are you sad? Are you angry? And this graphic is something that our students made up. And the thing that was um, so interesting about this to me was um, depression, anxiety, and suicide. And so if you're suicidal and you're driving, um, how do you recognize that in yourself? And, and what do you do to seek help? And if you're anxious, how are you coping with that anxiety? And so with the legalization of marijuana, we're finding more and more um, people are turning to smoking marijuana to cope with anxiety. And so that got us asking the question, um, do you know, like, where are you getting your marijuana from? you know, if you don't have access to a medical dispensary or a BC cannabis store, 
you know, what is the role of a drug dealer in community? And so do you know about naloxone? And what we were finding is that people did not know about naloxone. And so we were able to introduce naloxone training into the driver training in a very organic, safe way. So it's not about judgment or, or who's using or who's not using, but simply making this available, which we think is just so critical in the middle of an opioid crisis in our province. Um, in our work, we look for places of cultural relevance that people feel comfortable in that already have a relationship with Indigenous people. So whether it's a friendship center or, um, you know, our chief and council, uh, council chambers, um, lots of communities have been very gracious in opening their doors to us to be able to provide this in, in a place where people feel um, comfortable and confident. One of the things I'm really excited about that ICBC just did with me is they came to New Ianch and we were able for the second time in ICBC's history to write the class 7L test in community. Because we did that, it saved the nation over $10,000 in lost wages and travel costs so that the community did not have to go to Service BC to write their learner's test. Um, it's not always about, you know, you know, a driver's license. In this case, this woman wanted her license so that she could take her grandmother to her medical appointments. Um, one of the things that we've learned and been able to educate community on is what are all of the points and fines that you can get that are withholding your license. So this woman had some tickets from the Sky Train that were held against her license. So her community was able to um, actually pay her fines because it was cheaper to pay her fines and get her driver's license than to pay for medical transportation. Um, you can see here, she's pretty happy. We integrate car seat training into our driver training and ICBC again said, well, that's not normal. <laughs> and what I learned is that car seats are not available in British Columbia. And so in Burns Lake, you can't buy a car seat for a two-year-old. In Dees Lake, you can't buy a car seat. In Haida Gwaii, you can't buy a car seat. And so we have lots of children being held in laps. And so the communication with RCMP is to say, um, parents aren't trying to be bad parents. This product simply doesn't exist because nobody sells it. And so then being able to build a relationship between BCAA and the community so that we can get safe car seats and get people trained on how to use them. Um, so that was a big eye opener for me when I was in community. This picture um, has a lot of significance to me. So I wear glasses and these sisters here are wearing glasses and they both got their, their learners on the same day, but they both showed up without glasses and they both failed the eye exam. And so um, they said, well, we have glasses, but they're broken. So we ran home and got them. And you'll notice in the picture that they're both taped on the side. And glasses has got to be one of my biggest challenges in community. And so what's happening is the teacher will ask you, can you read this on the board? And people will say no. And then they'll feel shame about not being able to read. But in truth, they actually can't see. And so what we're seeing is a real lack of optometry services in remote community, communities. Um, even in Haida Gwaii, the optometrist only goes a few times a year and there's not enough um, spaces for everybody. So then it's, we see you know, beautiful young girls that can't get their driver's license and be safe on the highway because they can't pass an eye exam. And so we're hoping that we can start to integrate optometry services into our driver training. Uh, again, another great story. So this young man uh, upgraded his driver's license to a class two with air brakes. And not only did he get a job driving the school bus, ensuring that all the students were safe getting to school, um, but he's from Whitsett and it meant that those students got to go to swimming lessons in Smithers. Um, so again, another life-saving skill and an, and an offshoot, if you will, from the work that we're doing that's allowing more community members to have um, life skills to be safe and to enjoy their territory. I had so many lessons learned here. Um, so again, another great student, this young man, um, he went to school to be an automotive technician. And what's fascinating in British Columbia is that you are allowed to go into trades training without a driver's license, um, whether it's welding, pipe fitting, carpentry, or fixing a car. It's hard to fix the car if you can't test drive it. Um, so he followed me around for a while. And as soon as we got him his license, he got a job as a mechanic at Chrysler. So it just was really interesting to see where the gaps are in trades training in the province and the work that needs to happen to close them. Um, again, another student, this girl had overcome some incredible hurdles. She lived almost 50K out of town. Um, I would consider her to be in a very uh, extreme situation. So 
no running water, having to have a shower at school, um, like a, a tough life. And this meant the world to her. And she contacted me recently and said, you know, Lucy, would you be a reference on my resume um, for the military? And to know that everything that she's overcome um, in graduating high school and then turning around being able to serve our country and knowing that she can do it safely. And my last slide is just an, an example of um, what it looks like in community when we go and we, we have to support people to get into town um, to write their learner's test. So ICBC is not accessible to everybody. Sometimes it requires float planes and boats um, and vans and, and long multi-day trips. Um, and I think it's really fascinating the things that I took for granted in the past that um, you know we're, we're learning what the barriers are to people. And, and every single time I've seen somebody given the opportunity um, to rise to the occasion of their own life, they take it. And the gratitude and the joy that I found in this, in this business is incredible. One of the things that I told myself is that, um, you know, I'm not going to get emotionally attached to this business. This is the third business I've owned. And I just feel like um, I am in it for life. I have found my life's work and I am so blessed to be a part of it. So um, that's what All Nations Driving Academy is. And I look forward to answering questions uh, throughout the presentations as the other folks present. Oh, wonderful, Lucy. As um, as somebody that spent over 15 years in the mining sector, I can certainly appreciate the need and probably overwhelming demand for a service such as yours. And I have worked with some some communities here in the interior that I know are quite eager to 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 reach out to you and to embrace your your service. One question I have, um, and then I'll open it up to the audience for some questions, because I'm sure there's lots out there, is your service has certainly identified that you cannot compartmentalize issues, socioeconomic issues in northern and remote communities. And I was just curious, what's been another big barrier um, to seeing more communities embrace your programming? And what what's something that's out there that potential partners could really kind of step up to, to make it easier for you? Okay, so I, my first real challenge is identification. So ICBC does not accept a laminated status card as primary ID. Um, so I'll get, hide a guy, let's talk about that. So Service BC office was actually closed. Um, so you couldn't order a birth certificate. And this meant that I used my laptop and my visa and my hotspot on my cell phone to order people birth certificates. Now that seems extreme when Service BC is a, a government entity that should be serving people because you can't get a debit visa on Haida Gwaii. Um, and if you live on reserve, it's hard to get credit to get a visa. So these are some of the challenges that I'm, I'm seeing and, and just looping back, whether it's with banks or with ICBC or Ministry of Citizen Services to say, hey, we need to step up our game here because there's some gaps in the system. Um, one of the interesting insights from community is that when something has been a barrier for so long, uh, when we're working with community, oftentimes I'm working with first generation drivers. That means nobody in the family has ever had a driver's license. And so we're breaking this cultural stigma that we don't drive. So that in and of itself is a, um, a huge step forward. And once one person gets the license, then you know what, the next class we might have 50 people <laughs> show up, which is amazing. Um, you know, I think for people that are listening, whether they're in the, the mining sector, the banking sector is, you know, to say, what can we do to have a conversation about some of the things that we're seeing um, on the road? And, and one of the really important things for me was I, I worked in oil and gas, and this is what community asked for. And oftentimes, you know, community will tell us something and then we respond with something else. So it's, you know, how can we meet people where they are with what they actually asked for and not show up with something different? Um, I think that's incredibly important. And I think having boots on the ground and being willing to be vulnerable and to say, I don't have all the answers um, is going to get you a lot farther than sitting there and, and thinking that you might. Um, yeah, and you say boots on the ground, what's been your biggest, like how has it been for you to deliver a service across 
the geography of Northern BC and having so much <laughs> wide space between these communities? Um, Nicole, the secret is audiobooks. <laughs> I, you know, and, and, and to know that, yeah, you are going to have a six hour commute between communities. Um, the more that you can organize your schedule, the better. Um, you have to really like driving. You know, I, uh, yoga saves my body all the time. Um, I would, I would say it's quite sore. Now, the intention was always to support communities to do this. It wasn't for me to be the driving instructor all the time. So the Heisla First Nation has a driving school. We now have a driving school owned by the Burns Lake Native Development Corporation, which is shared with the Six Nations in Burns Lake. So we see them with one of their instructors. And so, you know, they're operating all the time. Uh, and that's really, the, the, that's the dream. The dream is for me to take a step back and to say, you know what, we're helping facilitate communities to solve this problem themselves. And that's what we're seeing the students do in the car. And uh, one question from our audience was, what barrier was most surprising to you when you started out? Oh, I have to pick one. Um, you know, I would say on the community side, the glasses has, has really, I'm, I'm disappointed about that. And I'm disappointed because I think if we had better optometry, we would have better literacy. And if we had better literacy, we'd have better education outcomes. And I don't think that it's right that we have, you know, a certain demographic of society that's maybe not having higher high school graduation rates when really they just need they just need to see. And now every time I walk into an optometry office, I, f I realize I'm so privileged, right? And it's like, I'm so lucky that I can take these glasses off the shelf and try them on and you know, pay my $90 to get my eyes checked. And people just don't even have that. Um, so that's, that's been my, uh, my moment. And I think that if I had another, you know, bit of surprise, like I've worked in the oil and gas community for a while and in construction is um, I'd hope to see more people stepping up and, and helping, right? And helping make sure that we fulfill our commitment to UNDRIP and to seeing Indigenous people go to work like we said we would. Great. I did notice that uh, we do not have any other questions in, in chat, but we do have some comments. And, and with entrepreneurship, we work so hard and our heads are down and quite often we don't see what's mm -hmm. going on below the surface. So I think it's just worth taking a minute here for me to read, Lucy, for you a couple of these comments if you haven't seen them already, just the, the gratitude people are showing. For example, Lynn says, having lived in Smithers, finding this very meaningful. Thank you, Lucy, for what you are doing. And Danielle says, this is such an important history that you are sharing here. And Brenda says, this is amazing, Lucy. <laughs> Wonderful to introduce naloxone to prevent overdoses as part of driver training. Love it. Wow. And lastly, I've got, well, we've got two more. Jen here comments, every business leader should be taking a page out of your book, Lucy. This is how it is done. Loving these learnings you are sharing and how you found smart solutions to remove the barriers. So much yes to that. And the last one, Danielle chimes in and says, great community service, Lucy. So a lot of gratitude, a lot of love out there, a lot of kindness. So I just wanted to share that with you. And uh, before we move on, I did have one question here. Since you did touch on Lucy, that other countries like New Zealand, Australia, mm -hmm. and others, other parts, if not every province, every territory within Canada has, you know, similar issues and challenges that you're dealing with mainly on Vancouver Island and on the west coast of, of British Columbia. Have you been approached on it by a national level or other other countries to <laughs> take everything that you've learned? Or is there, are, are you really the model or the template and you're making it? Or, or is there, have you seen inspiration and validators in other countries and other regions that are doing what you're doing? Or are you Kind of trailblazing as you go. <laughs> um, I'm a little bit of a cowgirl. I did just recently present to an organization called uh, CCMTA, so Canadian Council of Motor Transport Administrators, and that is um, the head of licensing and policy from every province territory across the country. And there is a program in Australia called Driving Change, and they had actually um, did driver training in remote Indigenous communities around employment. And our focus is 
become employment, but more so health now actually in safety. Um, so if we think about a lot of the remote communities in BC and people evacuating a tsunami um, or forest fires, those things aren't possible right now. So there is some collaboration with other people in, in other countries. Um, I've done a fair bit of work with the province and the federal government now. Um, one of their recommendations to ministers was research. And I was a little bit upset about that because I thought people have been researched to death. Um, but I thought, well, if we're going to do this, let's do it. So I'm actually starting my doctorate on this topic in January. So, And that feels very not entrepreneurial to me. Um, but learning as an entrepreneur, how do you play the game in approaching the treasury board? And, and this is a national conversation now. So, um, you know, me kind of taking a step back and going, okay, you know, how do we build businesses and fix a problem and engage government at the same time? Thanks so much for that. Okay. All right, Nicole, did you want to uh, okay. take it away here? Sure. So thank you so much for that, Lucy. I think um, I think you'll likely have a lot of follow up from today. And uh, I know I certainly am going to be following up with you with a few questions as well. But just want to thank you for all you're doing. All right, our next speaker. So our next speaker is Kira Montgomery. She's the founder and owner of Twin Feather Shop. So Twin Feather Shop is a brand new online store based in Saskatchewan that sells metaphysical items with the intent of helping people with their own personal healing journey. The main goal of Twin Feather is to inspire people to heal and give back to communities in need. And this in turn spreads awareness of Indigenous traditions, spiritual practices, along with other healing modalities. Kara identifies as a Métis and African-American woman and Twin Feather is the manifestation of her own healing journey and alignment with spirituality and community. Her connection to the metaphysical realm and traditional ceremonies has guided her throughout her life and has ignited her passion to share it with the world. Kira Miigwech for joining us tonight and please tell us all about Twin Feather. Thank you. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am on for homeland of the Métis people. So yeah, my, yeah, my name is Kira. Firstly, I am a mother, uh, an American, and I am the owner of Twin Feather. So, uh, Twin Feather is the manifestation of my own healing journey. Um, so, so as a youth, I struggled with uh, teenage substance abuse and addiction in and out of treatment centers and detox centers, um, which now as an adult, I understand is it was a, a result of, um, you know, trauma. Um, in my youth, I, I always felt connected to the physical realm and spirit. Um, I'd frequently frequent take part in, in ceremonies, and I felt a, a really strong bond to Mother Earth um, through crystals and plant medicines. But there was there was a blockage um, due to my shadow self um, and that I needed to fully understand and order to truly dive into my series, like hearing what I'm saying. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I didn't understand it and didn't go through the pain to understand my own spirituality. Um, yes, yeah, my eventual unconventional and life spiritual journey Gain when I, I was first time of life, and um, I've to, to have been guided by many spiritual leaders uh, along my journey. But you know, none have given me as much me purpose as 
newborn sat ties down. So during the first month of my recovery, I found a set of um, and community with a small group of people that spiritually centered on. I began with different healing modalities, as you know, the embodiment of yoga, sound healing, reading oracles, mission. Um, well, I was finding healing and feeling for my community and motherhood. My passion to inspire others and help others on their own healing journey. Um, yeah, that ignited. <laughs> so I started facilitating geo ceremonies, um, cantations, just holding space for people that that needed it. Um, while while finding my own own way um, with the intent to inspire my small community, um, I had the idea to open up a store with the vision of helping a large more global community and promoting healing methods um, that I had learned, which had a great impact on my life. Um, I felt inspired, although I didn't, I didn't know how to, and I didn't, I didn't think I was ready to take on such responsibility um and standing door so this was yeah i guess the idea had come um, three and a half years ago um instead of um, my store i decided to go with the same aim of helping people heal um i was almost done my schooling to become a primary care paramedic when the covid 19 pandemic hit regina um so my class was postponed and I was taken off my practicum course. Uh, I was discouraged, but in height, um, I know I was gifted with five months to be able to reconnect with myself and spirit while rehabilitating from my newly acquired traumas and stressors. Uh, during the pandemic lockdown, it was, you know, it was clear that I needed to go after what I was passionate about. And um, the intellect gave me the motivation, drive, belief that it was time to manifest the vision of Twin Feather. And, and yeah, so Feather Shop is a online store. We are based in Saskatchewan that sells uh, the main goal of, as, as uh, we had David says, to, to help people heal and, you know, to give back to communities in need. Um, you know, we're spreading awareness of Indigenous traditions, different spiritual practices, uh, different healing modalities. And yeah, Twin Feathers' vision is to, to make, um, to make spiritual healing more accessible um, to everyone. And yeah, so that's that's the story. That's my story. It um, Twin Feather's story is just, it's my story. So I feel very like, you know, grateful and passionate that I get to do what, what I like to do. And I, I love hanging out with my crystals and my singing bowls and and all the things that have helped me in my healing journeys it's it just it's perfect that now i have this this store um we just launched the store last saturday so we're brand new um we've been getting an incredible amount of love and sorts and i'm just really excited to see where where this goes um yeah that's that's it that's it for me <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Kira. I, one thing I've definitely seen that's common among young entrepreneurs, specifically young Indigenous entrepreneurs, is a lot of them 
succeeding in business because they've looked at embracing healing from a life of, of trauma and and life experience. And so I was wondering if you had advice for other youth on how they can potentially embrace the healing journey and really kind of use that to embolden pursuing entrepreneurship. Um, well, I think for me, like it was just, you know, something that I live by now is like, if something shows up for me, and it's for my healing, like no matter what it is, like, it's like, I surrender my hands up. And I just say yes, just like say yes to the adventure. Um, and, and I think like that just like helps. Yeah, it just helps embrace like the 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 journey. And I think when you say yes, to things just like happen for you. And not to you, it just happens. And and if you looking say five, six years out, if you end up being super successful with Twin Feather, what would be a really ambitious goal of yours um, in terms of what you could do with your business to have more impact? Yeah, so I think the goal would be hoping we can do it sooner than that even is to be able to go, you know, up north in Saskatchewan or anywhere really across Canada and go to, you know, communities that don't have um, accessibility to, to, to spiritual healing as, as much as we do here in the and to go there and like run some youth trees or, you know, do something for the youth because I think like that's where that's where the healing starts is in the kids and in the youth. So to be able to go, yeah, go to community and just spread awareness and, and spread love, really. That's awesome. Uh, do you do work currently with any youth um, in the city around you? Not right now, no. Um, last year I got to go up north and be part of a retreat. I just volunteered my time to go and help out with this retreat with. We had, uh, I think, 14 youth from Montreal Lake and same kind of idea. Um, ran a retreat with them and they got to sleep in the teepees and do some nature hikes. And yeah, it was really, it was really, really awesome. That's excellent. Just checking if we had any questions from our audience before we moved on. I think Kira's done an excellent job of telling us all about her store. And I know I'm personally encouraging everyone to go have a look and you can get some of your holiday shopping done early. I've just been looking through the chat here. I did just <laughs> exactly. post the, uh, the, the, uh, the URL, your website, Kira, for, uh, for Twin Feather Shop in the chat. So everybody that's attending here today will have easy access to all the wonderful things you have on there. Uh, I haven't seen any other questions on here uh, that, that I can I can tell right, right yet. But, but Kira, I, I, had a, I had a question for you. Um, entrepreneurship to get started, especially, it can seem really overwhelming. It can be very intimidating. Who when you started out and also now, who would you say has been your mentor or your inspiration or your hero or someone that you can look up to? And uh, that and also uh, what organizations have helped you along the way besides the ones that you've mentioned already? Yeah, so when I started, um, started thinking of different, um, you know, business ideas because I knew that there was funding available and that like, this vision could actually become real. So Clarence Campo Development Fund here in Saskatchewan, um, they helped me, um, you know, with all the financial stuff and getting started and and then Futurepreneur, um, which has been really great because I've gotten, you know, a mentor who's really um, helpful in things that I, I don't know about. Um, so, yeah, those those are the two that I've been working with. Um, other than that, like my family and you know my friends have just been incredibly supportive um, through this journey, and 
yeah, like it was funny because I was like finishing paramedic school and still like working on the ambulance while starting this truck or was still starting this store. So yeah, it's just been it's been kind of crazy that it's that it's here now. But I think yeah, just like all my friends and family and having the support of Futurepreneur and Clarence Campo, like they've been yeah, really, really awesome for me. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, there is lots of love being shared on chat. You may want to go have a look at, at, at some of the wonderful comments there. Uh, I did see a couple of questions here. I did see Brenda has asked, well, first she said, this is so awesome, Kara, to take what helped with your healing to share with the world. And her question is, if one was starting with healing, which of the various things that helped you would you suggest someone start with? Yeah, I think um, yoga is is really good for us because we can connect back to our body and with our breath, we can connect back with spirit. And I think that's that would probably be my number one. Yoga and meditation, they kind of go hand in hand, those two for sure. But also looking at, um, like for me, like sweat lodge was a huge a huge part of my healing in, you know, in the beginning and even now, like, um, so doing stuff like that, I think would, would be good. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, one last question here, uh, we have, and Shelly asks what town or city in Saskatchewan are you located in and what is the address of your store? Do you actually have a physical store or are you an online store? So I am, I am in Regina, Saskatchewan, um, but we don't have a physical store. It's totally all online. Um, yeah, so you can check out our website because we're all online. <laughs> there we go, twinfeather.ca, as I put in there, Shelly and everybody else, it is on there. Um, now, you did mention Futurepreneur, and I do want to take a moment to ask Joanne Norris to come on both on her mic and her video. So Joanne is the National Director of Indigenous and Northern Communities for Futurepreneur, and I've known her and the impactful work <laughs> she's done for a couple of years. And I will say Joanne has really been the catalyst uh, to help spearhead making this impactful event happen tonight. So Joanne, I'd love to get you give you a few minutes to tell us all what Futurepreneur is doing with Indigenous and Northern Communities. Sure. Thank you, Colin. And so great to hear your story, Kira. And really glad that, uh, you know, you put your hand up when we said, hey, Kira, do you want to do this? Because, you know, we're, we're just getting to know each other. And uh, so thanks again. It was wonderful to have you. So Futurepreneur, we, we started developing a more um, strategic strategy to serve and support young Indigenous entrepreneurs about seven years ago through our Thrive North initiative here in Northern BC. That's how I met Lucy. Uh, and Lucy, was, we used to run a, a Thrive North business challenge uh, as part of that initiative. And Lucy was one of the winners of that challenge, um, I think about four years ago now. And so our mandate really is, is to work with other Indigenous organizations such as the Aboriginal financial institutions like Clarence Campo Development Fund in Saskatchewan, as well as across the country. So we have other relationships um, with AFIs um, here in BC, for example, with uh, NEDC on Vancouver Island. And for those of you who are Indigenous and don't know about the Aboriginal financial institutions, uh, you should go to NACCA, N-A-C-C-A dot C-A, and there's a listing of, there's almost 60 of them across the country. And Futurepreneur, our, our, our secret sauce is helping young people just like Kiera and, and David, who's going to speak, and even Nicole uh, worked with Futurepreneur a few years ago as well. Um, so we're just here to help the under 39 people get going, get started through financing, mentorship, and business plan support. So I'm happy to connect with anybody offline and thanks so much. Yeah, it's great to hear all your stories. Great, thank you, Joanne, so much for that. And now, Nicole, there she is. Jump back on, great. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Joanne. And thank you again, Kira, for, for your bravery and coming online to tell us your story tonight. Our third speaker this evening is Chief Coyote Nelson, Executive Director of Nawalakwe. Chief Coyote is a hereditary chief, an adventure guide, and a language and cultural teacher. Hailing from Alert Bay, BC, Coyote is an internationally renowned cultural steward of the Kwakwakwak, a sought after dancer and song keep who has mastered all the great dances of the Kwakwakwak and he's an accomplished artist and often designs traditional regalia for potlatches and commissions. Now Lakwe is an innovative world-class upcoming social enterprise and I'm gonna let you him tell you all about it. Uh, Chief Cody, thank you. And please tell us all about your exciting new venture. Yeah. Uh Hello, everybody. My name is Kyoti Nelson, and I am from the four tribes of King Commandment, as well as some cloud place. And I'm here to talk uh Prawl Nawalo. Uh, uh Nawalo would mean supernatural. Uh uh in a language, very endangered quack language, I must add. As you hear more about the story, you'll you'll know that the tradition of our language is at the heart of what we are doing. And so I'm just really happy to be here and and uh, uh, yeah, excited stuff that I'm hearing, and so I'm just happy to be a part of this group. And I hope, uh, 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 yeah. So, uh, like I said, now in supernatural in our little language, and the journey that we've been on uh, for the last three years has been in my mind supernatural journey uh, uh, to mention that I also am a part of a uh, tourism company and had been guiding for a number of years in our traditional territory, mainly for very high-end Europe, European clientele. And uh, about five summers ago, we came around the corner to one of our beautiful sites in our territory called Hada. And to our very, uh, very, very disappointment, we came around the corner and there was a heli logging operation happening right in the uh, estuary of a very special site of ours called Hada. And it was literally like somebody shot us in the heart and the question started to arise in our head, how could somebody give them permission to do this in our sacred sites? And so Hada is special to our people of the Kliksut Dinuk because our uh, one of our ancestors was believed to come from that valley from the very beginning of time. And so a lot of thought and, and uh, a lot of thought went into how could this happen? And uh, it came to our realization that we don't have a presence out in our traditional territory. And it was then that I realized that this was the exact reason why the Canadian government put us on little plots of land called Indian reservations was so that resource extraction could happen without very little resistance. And so how do we reverse that? And the idea was, well, we need to get out into our territories, which we thought we were doing by uh, doing the ecotourism, but to have a physical uh, presence year round 
is uh, was the next step in that. And so uh, seeds were planted in in our brains around uh, if we just had some sort of structure on that shoreline, the thought was we probably could have saved that uh, site from being heli logged. And so a lot of uh, effort and time and energy started uh, going towards uh, building something. And at first we were just gonna build a little shack. We were saving uh, 22 foot roof trusses from uh, houses that were being torn down in our, at a local uh, reservation in Guilford. And we had a bunch of volunteer carpenters from our nations that believed in the cause and we were just gonna go and uh, build something in those earlier, earlier days. And so uh, as, as we moved on, uh, the thought was, what could we use it for? And I knew that my time as an ecotourism guide, I knew that we probably could use it for tourism during the summer months. And what's uh, interesting is I, uh, at that time I was a culture teacher at a local school trying to revive our language, a language which we only have probably 75 fluent speakers left. And during that time that I worked at the school, we would take our kids out into uh, their traditional homelands for one week in June. And what we were finding uh, during that one week, we would bring elders with us, was that the kids were retaining uh, a lot of language compared to what I was able to teach in a classroom setting. And so having both of those experiences, uh, knowing that European clientele would spend multi-day trips with us during the summer, but also knowing that our children were thriving in uh, remote settings in the forest and learning stuff on the beach. It was, more, it was a more natural uh, setting for them to learn. And so obviously I thought we could use our site for language during the winter months during the school time of the year and could we use it for uh, tourism during the summer months and at that time i have to be very honest the whole social uh social venture side of it had not yet materialized it was it was thought that the tourism could bring in some money much needed jobs to our territory and then we would just flip it right over and then during the winter months we could use it for uh, language revitalization cultural revitalization mental wellness programming uh, as most of you know the first nations people of our country have suffered years of uh, intergenerational traumas and uh, so in our area this could fit very well at least that's what i was thinking uh, back then and so at the heart of the now allowed vision is our children and you see this one slide here uh, that reflects that and so we now have serious uh, partnerships with organizations like the first nations health authority and uh, universities where we we want to promote the the growth of our of our children so that they can have a stronger foundation than we had when we were their age. And so, uh, so the idea started to grow. Uh, at that time, like I said, we were saving roof trusses from moldy uh, houses and we were just gonna go and do something. And I had the opportunity uh, because I was spending a lot of time, I had a, we were fortunate enough to get a, uh, a grant, federal grant for a feasibility study to be done. And, uh, and so the word was getting out about this vision or this uh, idea. And I had this opportunity to go speak to a number of people at a local resort called Nemo Bay and uh, Nemo Bay is a very high-end resort in our territory. 
and I had an opportunity to go uh, speak to a number of people that happened to be uh, there that could potentially help. That's what was told to me that uh, you'll be presenting and you never know, there might be somebody there that might help. And so you have to remember that I was a elementary school teacher at the time. I didn't have very much money to put towards this, but I was spending a lot of time and effort into this idea. And so I went to present uh, this idea. And the reason why I believe that this is a spiritual now allowed, uh, movement that is happening with this vision uh, is because when I was speaking, an individual to my right just started writing stuff down, just writing, writing, writing the whole time I was uh, presenting. And uh, after about 20 minutes, the presentation was over. I had all these nice uh, renderings of what the lodge could potentially look like. Uh, I had the feasibility in my hand, and and so what happened was he waited until everybody left the room, and he closed the door, and uh, he said, how much do you need to get this started? And at that time, I thought that we could do something quite substantial for $1.8 to $2.1 million, and I just went. I just went for it. I said, uh, I believe that we could do this for 1.8 to $2.1 million. And he looked at me and said, I could do two. And uh, that's when the Nowalog vision really took off. Uh, it turned out that this individual runs a philanthropic families trust fund uh, and that they wanted to spend some money on indigenous wellness programming. And so they were very interested in knowing what the uh, what wellness I was talking about, and they weren't too interested in the ecotourism until I explained to him that the vision that I have is that how do we pay for our wellness? Then we can think about doing language revitalization. We could think about uh, mental wellness and all the good stuff, but how do we pay for it? And it wasn't until I explained that I see it that we're going to use the profits from the ecotourism resort to pay for our wellness, creating our own ecosystem. And so it was at that time that uh, that things really got moving. Currently, we are uh, in phase one, developing the culture camp, which will house our language revitalization. And then phase two will be the uh, world-class ecotourism uh, venture, which then will support our wellness and initiatives. And so I think this is what is, uh, there's a lot of energy around our project at the moment, very positive energy. Tons of people are wanting to help and asking uh, how they can help. And I think it's because we have this model, at least this model that shows that uh, we could sustain ourselves and we could sustain our wellness and I won't have to stand there with my hand up to the government and and ask for uh, assistance with our wellness and so it's a pretty exciting project that we are doing a lot of what we are doing is uh, not only to create jobs and and to create a presence in our territory but we also want to be the stewards of our land again uh, because we totally believe that we can steward our lands a lot better than they have been uh, over the last 150, 200 years. Uh, so that is a big component of what we are doing as well. Uh, we, we totally believe that what we are doing is going to be the flagship uh, project in Canada for this reconciliation movement that is going across the country at the moment the excitement and energy level that we have and the support that we are uh, coming on board is is pointing in that direction. And so we really take the responsibility seriously and we wanna show that this model can and will be used probably all over the world if we can, or not if, when we prove that it, it can be done. Uh, I, I'm just aware of the time now and I'll, I'll make it quick. Uh, 
another thing that we are super proud of is that during this time of COVID, the same family, one of the families that are supporting us, gave us an opportunity to do whatever the heck we wanted in our communities with uh, some money. We didn't ask for it, it was just given. Uh, and they trusted us with whatever projects we, we would uh, do for our communities. Uh, at that time here in Alert Bay, grocery stores were empty, very little protein, very little vegetables. So the idea was, could we get uh, garden boxes built for our, at least for our elders? And so over a hundred garden boxes were built and we hired eight of our youth to administer those boxes uh, with uh, the help of a, an adult. And uh, so we were really super proud of that as well. We are busy at the moment with traditional food harvesting for, for the same purpose, uh, lack of protein and and food security was a big issue and continues to be a big issue since the pandemic. And so this is an area that we are super proud of as well. And then we just wanted to mention that. Uh, we do have a website and we are very open to discussing with anybody that is interested to learn more. Please go to our website and, and check us out and uh, and yeah, if anybody wants to talk to me personally, uh, you could also do that through our website. And so I just once again want to say thank you for, for all of your time. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chief Coyote, for sharing that. I'm personally very enthusiastic for this project you're doing. And like you said, I think it's going to be an incredible model to potentially be embraced by, by many communities. Uh, one question I'd like to ask is with the tourism sector being one of the hardest hit by COVID this year, have you had to uh, adjust your plans or how you plan to operate either phase one or two uh, in the coming, say, 12 months? Yeah, so phase one, that's a really good question. And it's something that's come up, obviously, with COVID. Uh, so phase one, just to be clear, is a, is a culture camp. We're calling it the culture camp phase where uh, school groups would come in. And there was some debate whether we should be doing a lodge first or like why would we want to do a culture camp first because I thought we have to fund it somehow. And it was the fact that we have about 75 fluent speakers left and I was able to push hard that we don't have four years to build an ecotourism resort. Uh, every year, every winter, we're going to lose our elders. And so can we do the language camp first and then worry about the a large second and so we're really happy that we are doing it the way we're doing it uh, but COVID has to answer your question COVID has added a lot of pressure because even with school groups uh, you know we were building our camp to house 24 and now you know are we even going to have school groups and so uh, we are also in talks with universities on utilizing our space for ecological studies, uh, marine biology studies, and, and other things as, as well. And so there's a lot of excitement to, to use our space. And so those are different avenues that we are looking at uh, for revenue streams or uh, just different possibilities. So we're open for discussion on anybody's ideas on that as well, because it is a, uh, it is a super uh, big problem that that we have uh, but just to let you know that the scale that we are doing it on we're only looking at nine to ten uh, room units uh, and we would never ever go any bigger than that so that's why it's going to be very high end and so at those at that scale uh, COVID practices could be uh, adhered to pretty good so yeah Hopefully that answers. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, we got one question in the chat here, and I apologize if you answered this. I have 
uh, terrible internet where I am right now. But where, how close is the culture camp and lodge uh, located relative to Alert Bay? Yeah, so it it will be a, a hour and a half boat ride from Port McNeil and about an hour and 15, hour and 20 from Alert Bay. And so it will be a, a bit of a boat ride. And uh, yeah, it's in a very remote area. We thought that, uh, you know, the river systems need protection from what I talked about earlier with the industry. And uh, can we strategically put stakes in the ground where we want to we want to protect these river systems and our people have been left out of the economic growth and and you know million trillions of dollars are taken out of our territory and we don't ever partake in that and so this is a way to start employing our people and to start uh getting our elbows out there and and shoving other people <laughs> around as well so <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, COVID and funding aside, what has been your biggest challenge kind of just getting things off the ground this last year? Yeah, it's been, there's been challenges with the province to tell you the truth. Uh, it's been a very difficult, uh, it's been a very difficult project for me in, in that we have to ask permission to build in our own territory and to get building permits and to get all these uh, crazy stuff. And and so staying positive uh, when those talks have to happen and just keeping, keeping things real and not letting your emotions take over has been a challenge for me because uh, there's Shell Midden in that particular site that we are building that is, you know, thousands of years old. And so why can't we just go and build there? Uh, has always been my question. And so it's that's been a challenge for me to stay positive. Yeah, yeah, that's all really good points. Um, and I think you're certainly not alone in that in that battle as well. So I just want to see if there's any other questions for Chief Coyote while we have him on here. Great. Well, uh, certainly uh, like Colin was doing, I encourage you to have a look through some of the comments from, from the audience here. There's some um, accolades for you on, on coming up with this great, uh, this great project and finding ways to circle back, uh, finding the balance between um, uh, economic opportunities and looping that back in with your community. So thank you so much for your, your time and uh, hands up for all the work that you're you're doing for your community. Okay, like Kessler and Nicole, thank you. Okay, I'm going to hop over to our fourth speaker. All right, I was just making sure Colin didn't want to pop in at all because he kind of catches me off guard. <laughs> All right, our first speaker, Anita Pollock, founder and president of Race Rocks 3D. Oh. Colin. Are you wanting to pop in at all? I'll keep. Oh, sorry. sorry about that. Sorry. I've, so, I've, yeah, Anita I've Pollock is the founder and president of Race Rocks. No, nope, you're fired, you're cut off. Okay. Sorry, I can't tell if my uh, connection is bad or if that's just, but Anita looks like she's still moving, so we'll keep going. <laughs> uh, I definitely am full support of what the government proposed the other day about ensuring that we all get on high speed internet pretty quickly here. <laughs> 
So RaceRocks 3D is a leading technology company that offers learning and data analytics for the aerospace and defense industries, including augmented and virtual reality training. Anita is an experienced controller and project manager with a background across multiple sectors, including information technology, construction and land and business development. Anita possesses extensive experience in working alongside her clients and employees to ensure timely and successful outcomes for all her clients, including the Royal Canadian Navy and Canadian Coast Guard. So Anita, I'd love to hear more about all the cool work you're doing, um, both with your business and, and beyond. Super, thanks, Nicole. All right, thank you for having me here. My name's Anita Pollock. I'm a Métis woman from St. Louis, Saskatchewan, Treaty 6 territory and homelands of the Métis on my mother's side with connections to British and Scottish settlers on my father's side. I am born and raised fifth generation on Vancouver Island and I acknowledge and thank the Lagwanquin people also known as the Songhees and First Nation communities for allowing us to work live and play on their lands. Tonight I'll share with you how my career started, my first venture, my first failure, our 10 year roller coaster ride with Race Rocks, Race Rocks becoming a certified Aboriginal business, the why and the opportunity, and weave throughout three of my entrepreneur aha moments. My career started back in the 90s in the public sector. I worked in internal audit for the federal government. My first introduction to technology-based work was when I had an opportunity within the internal audit department to move over to information systems auditing. Shortly after, I was introduced to the owners of a tech startup called Abe Books. I was asked to join the team to bridge the gap between accounting and technology. Six years later, Abe Books was purchased by Amazon. The owners of Abe Books also mentored me to become an entrepreneur. Guidance that led me to co-found our first business in construction and development. It was 2003 and the economy was booming. We saw the opportunity for land development and construction. We received a lot of negative feedback from family and friends. There were three large construction companies that monopolized the construction industry on Vancouver Island. Instead of letting this stop us, we jumped in with both feet. This was my first aha moment as an entrepreneur. I believe that I had a solid understanding on how to run a business, at least 75% confident. Within the first month, I realized at best, I knew 10%. We hit the ground learning. In five years, we grew our team to 50 employees and had completed multiple commercial and residential developments with a construction value of over $10 million. Then the 2008 financial crisis hit. Back to knowing 10% on how to run a business, I knew 0% on how to navigate a business through a recession. Forced to confront words like bankruptcy, we put our heads together to try to find a way to soften the blow. We still owned a remote piece of property that was not yet zoned for commercial use, which meant we were not allowed to build permanent structures on it. What do you do with 48 acres in the middle of nowhere? We built a storage company out of containers. The bad news is the construction company ended in bankruptcy. The good news is the storage company is alive and thriving today and paying shareholders to its dividends. And paying dividends to its shareholders. Race Rocks. Race Rocks was incorporated in September 2010. Before the bankruptcy, we started to look for opportunities in other markets to diversify our portfolios. I met my business partner, Scott Dewis, who also lived through a bankruptcy coming out of a career in visual effects in Hollywood. We were presented with the idea to build 3D models for Canadian military training programs. The Canadian military was starting to look for ways to train their soldiers with distributed learning. The current military courseware was built in legacy systems that was not easy to run on large networks due to, due to their size. 
year one of our 10 year roller coaster ride. Race Rock's first year was primarily sent, spent as a research and development house. We trained a team of 3D artists to build 3D models with high fidelity. We achieved this by applying the best practices of Hollywood visual effects to keep the size of the models at a, min at a minimum. We trained a team of four and with much enthusiasm and excitement, we started our first descent downhill. Year two, we subcontracted to a large defense company and integrated our low, low res 3D models into defense training courseware. We grew our team to eight and started to climb our first hill. Year three, we saw an opportunity to increase engagement and training by applying Hollywood information transfer techniques, by applying storytelling with real life scenarios in a gameplay environment. We subcontracted to a large defense company and won a five year, five year multi-million dollar contract. To start, we had to go through a security clearance that took us 12 months. With much anticipated excitement, we grew our team to 20, adding learning designers, developers, artists, and project managers. To fund the growth, we borrowed against our shred claims. These are government credit programs highly utilized by tech companies for research and development. We were approaching the top of our first hill. Year four, a black cloud rolls in. Government cuts defense spending and audits all of our shred claims with a fine tooth comb. We lose our shred claim. Our contract was canceled before we even started and we lay off almost all of our team. Back down to a team of four, a million dollars in high interest debt. We're at the top of our first hill, but the future is not looking good. Year five, everything bursts into flames. Government is still not spending and we fall back on our film contacts and provide visual effects services to Hollywood. Our team is holding up four employees and we talk at lengths about throwing in the towel. Year six, back to the drawing board. We know we have a product that is exceeding industry expectations. In Canada, we have access to the world's best tech talent. We have the industry, contacts, and relationships to take us to the next level. This is my second aha moment as an entrepreneur. By subcontracting, we were leaving the fate of our contracts in the hands of another company. Believe it or not, we were given the same advice as we did when we started the construction company. Six large international defense companies monopolized the defense training federal government procurement. We decided to give it a go anyways. We teach ourselves government procurement and we get onto a federal government supply arrangement and standing offer program. From this, we win our first sole source government contract for technology enabled learning. We grow our team to eight, and we start to slowly crawl up the next hill. Year seven, there is a federal government election. All government spending is frozen. We are halfway up the hill, and we hang on with every bit of hope we have left. Our team shrinks back to four. Year eight. Our perseverance pays off. We win two government contracts. The first contract is for five years for 2.5 million. And the fourth and the second is a four year with a value of up to 6 million. Our team grows to 15. We are still holding the million dollars in debt on the books and we break into a slow jog uphill. Year nine, we diversify and move into software products and data analytics. We win two research and development projects worth 1.2 million. We grow our team to 20 and we can see the top of the hill. Year 10, present day. We win another five year government contract worth 10 million and continue our research and devel development projects. We now have a team of 30 and growing. We are working with conventional financing to take out our high interest debt and investors to grow our research and development products. We're on the top of a hill. The future looks bright. We know that we have a lot more hills to climb, 
and we have not forgotten the lessons we've learned. This is a highlight reel of some of the products that we have. We have technology enabled learning systems that enable teams and advanced data analytics and software development that empower critical decision makings to aerospace and defense. Our core technologies include virtual reality, augmented reality, simulation, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. In May of 2019, we became an indigenous owned led company when I assumed the chief executive position at Race Rocks. I was keen to use my company's knowledge of government procurement and technology to become active in helping other indigenous tech entrepreneurs work with government. The why. Innovation is creativity and indigenous peoples have always been innovators. We need to add our voice to the technology creative economy and make it easier for Indigenous people to join the ranks of technology entrepreneurs and to encourage Indigenous youth to find their passion in STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. The opportunity. In November of 2019, Justin Trudeau mandates the Minister of Procurement to identify and set aside 5% of the federal government's spending for qualified Indigenous owned companies. Canada spends around $22 billion yearly on procurement from industry. 5% equals over a billion dollars. This represented a major opportunity for all Indigenous entrepreneurs and their communities. Unfortunately, the federal government procurement system has not caught up with our prime minister's mandate to set aside 5% of federal government spending. I've since learned that Canada traditionally only sets aside 0.33% and has many layers of bureaucracy and rules that seemed aimed at keeping it this way. What can we do? From our track record, you know that we are not afraid of a challenge. My third aha moment as an entrepreneur. We will align a network of Indigenous tech companies across Canada to build a voice in Ottawa. We need to encourage setting aside 5% for Indigenous companies with a STEAM capacity building plan to bid on. To do this, we will need to work with Indigenous communities and academia to encourage STEAM career paths for Indigenous peoples. This is a generational life changing opportunity. We look forward to working with Indigenous tech companies, Indigenous communities, academia, and the federal government to bridge the gap between Indigenous tech and federal government procurement. Thank you. Whoa. That was incredible, thank you. I'm trying not to nerd out too much on the tech side of things. <laughs> um, I have a ton of questions written down. And again, I really wanna encourage anyone in the audience to please post if they have any questions or else I'll just dominate this uh, Q and A here. Um, the first thing that, that perked my interest was that you have experienced failure in business and certainly have um, seen success and moved on from that. I was curious what kind of advice you have for other business owners, especially with COVID applying so much pressure on businesses, what your advice would be for how someone can be a little less scared of potentially failing and how they could embrace that to turn it into a learning experience to, to move on to other things someday. That's a really good question. I would say that, um, being curious is something that is great for an entrepreneur and um, taking that and giving it a hundred percent is something that we know. I think majority of businesses that fail within the first five years is 
is massive. So you're not alone. I think that is, someone said something to me one time, you know, you're not special <laughs> because you failed. And, it's, and that's really was good to hear because failure is part of learning. I've learned more throughout my career by failing than I have from the successes. I look back at some of the successes and I'm not sure if it was timing, if it was luck, or if it was because somebody else did something I wasn't aware of. So I think for me to say to anyone uh, is go out and try it and know that um, it could be embarrassing and you could fail, but it'll just push you to go forward again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's excellent advice. I know as a business owner myself, you're certainly it is those failures and um, the lessons learned that, that you gain the most from. And I know I'm a big advocate when you go to conference, I love to hear failure stories more than success stories because you know I don't you don't learn a lot from from hearing how great and wonderful people are with with running their business sometimes the other thing um, that that I flagged here that I found interesting was certainly navigating the federal government's procurement process is extremely convoluted and if anything not transparent what advice would you have for other Indigenous entrepreneurs and communities on tips for kind of like uh, breaking through that or at least taking first steps to understand that process a bit better and, and helping us all kind of hit that 5% set aside goal that we, we'd like to see? Definitely. I would say that what we've done in the past is we ask a ton of questions. Uh, we see a uh, request for proposal hit the street and um, the first thing our sales and business development team is they, they rip through it and they anything in it that they aren't clear on it, they, they send back as many questions as they can. You can ask questions. You can also um, reach out to them and talk to them and ask them for help. That's something else that I don't think a lot of us do enough, right? We um, talk to other businesses that are on larger proposals. Ask us what we did. Reach out. Um, we asked a lot of questions. We had a lot of help along the way from government and also from other industry contacts and also submit the proposals. A lot of them possibly will not go through, but then you can ask for um, a debrief afterwards to see where you missed the points. And so you know that that section that you missed the points in from that proposal will be stronger in the second proposal that you put in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, those are really great. And I know at least from um, the private sector that I come from, I know that often there's a little bit more willingness to accommodate Indigenous um, uh, bidders to provide a more in-depth feedback on your on your bid packages as well. So definitely, yeah, pushing pushing back and trying to get some of that feedback is is critical. Okay, I know Colin wanted to jump in again. If there's not any other questions. There we go. Thank you for that. I need to thank you so much for sharing your story and your journey here with us today. I know I had the pleasure of speaking with you, I guess, a week or so ago to learn about Race Rocks 3D and all the other work that you're doing here, especially in STEAM uh, across the country. And there's so much potential and so much kind of underutilized potential here, especially with youth. And I know that is uh, that is a big mountain to climb and you're looking for other partners and other collaborators in order to move that forward because that is something I know you're very passionate about, but uh, you won't be able to do that on your own. So anybody out there watching today, uh, please reach out to Anita, reach out to us. We can connect you together. That's what we do. Just like the sign says, we connect people and we'd be happy to connect you to Anita uh, on a national level here because that 5%, that billion dollars a year is, is money that needs to go back in the community in a meaningful way, in a sustainable way, just like Chief Coyote is doing also. Uh, and that's what we need, that's that social and financial sustainability combined there. And you're doing great work. And I thank you for that and for sharing that today. Oh, thank you. And I did want to add out too that our, um, our marketing and sales team is more than happy to walk anyone on the phone through uh, billing out a procurement, the first steps that even actually are trying to apply or even actually trying to navigate the bid sites for the federal and provincial governments. Wonderful, wonderful. I did include the the website link for Race Rocks 3D in the chat. 
I also included, you mentioned shred. Some people out there is like, what the heck is shred? So I did include what that was as far as the scientific research. Thank you. Fund There's for also that. the interactive digital media tax credit in BC too. That's another fantastic um, utilization for our credit program for provincial side. Excellent, excellent. Great, well, thank you very much for that. Before we, N Nicole jumps back on uh, and introduces our last speaker of the evening, I did want Joanne Stone Campbell from Van City to uh, to come on for a moment, please, because she's gonna share with us all the impactful initiatives and things that she and her team are doing. Uh, Joanne is the Indigenous Portfolio Manager with Community Investment uh, with Van City. So I'd like to turn it over to, to Joanne to, uh, to say a few words on behalf of all the great work that Van City is doing. Thank you, and uh, almost evening. Um, I am just so inspired right now, listening to all the stories that my my blood is flowing. I'm, I'm just excited to hear uh, the process, how people started, their passion, um, where they're going, and how they connect to their communities and to their nations, um, and the pride they take uh, within themselves. Um, but I do really want to hold my hands up to our ancestors, to our elders, and to our leaders, uh, especially in my community, Squamish Nation, uh, where I'm speaking from today, um, and that they work in the work that they continue to do in our community. Um, working at Van City uh, has been a great uh, alignment. It really um, aligns with my values as a First Nations woman um, who has a, a daughter who's in university who lives in a First Nations community, who grew up in a First Nations community um, and understands some of our values um, that aligns well with me uh, moving forward in supporting um, the many um, initiatives that we have at Van City, especially um, today with the entrepreneurs. Um, I, I have a team that's helping me right now work on some of the um, collecting data and looking at what we have to offer, where we need to go. How do we support Indigenous entrepreneurs? Um, so I'm really excited about the work that we're doing, also indigenizing some of our um, financial um, curriculum um, and going out to the communities and educating our people um, to, to better understand financial. Again, some of us are first time, uh, first generation uh, graduating from school. Some of us are first generation coming out at a residential school. So we all have to take those into um, and looking at where we're going as an organization or as a nation or, or as an individual. So again, I just wanted to thank um, uh, Startup and Future Entrepreneur for introducing uh, me to this wonderful uh, second year uh, celebrating Indigenous entrepreneurs. I'm really excited. I will go back to the office and share um, with the staff on continuing to support this initiative. And um, yeah, there's lots to talk about, but I d again, just holding my hands up to the entrepreneurs and who they are and where they're going and their passion. I sure feel their passion. So again, thank you. Uh, it is medicine for my soul. Um, in all ways, so thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Joanne. Thank you for your um, for your words tonight and encouragement for all these entrepreneurs. Okay, our last speaker this evening is David Plamondon, Engagement Specialist and Team Guide of Pay Mataway Consulting and Gaming. With over 25 years of gaming experience and more than 10 years supporting Indigenous people in career planning and education, David began Pay Mataway Consulting to share his love of games and his drive to help Indigenous people succeed. Pay Mataway Consulting is an Indigenous owned and operated consulting organization that provides a range of services to their clients. They work to blend the traditional values of Indigenous culture, their passion for the work they do, and a wide range of tools to support their clients, such as some really cool custom tabletop gaming. David Miigwech for joining us this evening, and I'll pass it over to you. 
Uh, my name is David Pomondon. Uh, as introduced by Colin, I am the team guide uh, for Pemetaway uh, Together, um, which is uh, an amalgamation of both Pemetaway Consulting and Pemetaway Games. So I will talk a little bit about um, kind of the background of the company, where, why we started it, who we are, and um, you know what we're hoping to do with the work we're doing. So I know it was kind of already covered in my intro, but uh, I am the team guide and one of the founding partners for Pemetaway uh, Together. Um, Pemetaway Consulting, Pemetaway Games. So I've got over 10 years of working in Indigenous support roles. Uh, a big part of my focus has been working specifically in employment and education exploration for First Nation, Métis, and Inuit students and adults living in Alberta. Um, I've worked as an HR professional, a recruiter, um, and most recently before uh, focusing my efforts with uh, my own company, working in post-secondary and helping students explore post-secondary options to help that transition into employment. Um, I am a lifelong tabletop gamer. Uh, I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons since the early 90s. Uh, I grew up playing tabletop family games uh, with my family, uh, and I'm a proud Treaty 8 Nation member. Um, not able, not joining me today, obviously, but my business partner, uh, Jade Gravel, um, is uh, our, our, my, my co-founding partner. So she works specifically in coordinating and developing workshops um, and has over five years of experience in community engagement and support roles. Um, she's very actively engaged in supporting Indigenous youth, and um, she's also a proud member of the Métis Nation of, uh, Métis Nation of Alberta as well. So I'd like to start with just talking about the, the beginnings of Pemetewe and kind of where we started with, how we got to where we are. You know, I think it's important to a part of our journey is to talk about, you know, this, this is where we came from with the work. Um, it all started with a lot of relationship building. Um, we worked very closely with the Treaty 8 Nations, uh, with Treaty 8 First Nations of Alberta, the PTO, um, built relationships with a lot of the organizations here in Edmonton, so uh, Rupert Sign Institute and OTNL Employment and Training Society, both of which are assets holders and support Indigenous students that are exploring um, post-secondary options. Um, and with the work that we've done uh, alongside and with those organizations, we both really um, identified a lot of gaps uh, with the First Nation of Métis youth in Alberta. So working in employment, we see firsthand, you know, the challenges that students and, and even adults have in making that transition, coming from their home communities, moving into an urban setting, moving into a more corporate structure, moving into uh, employment in a variety of different ways that's, you know, different than the experiences they've had. Um, and so we wanted to work on trying to assist those, those individuals on a grassroots level you know, we found that it was great to be working, you know, with the with the city of Edmonton and employment or working with a post-secondary institution. Um, but by the time we were interacting with those individuals, they were, you know, in their late teens or um, early to late 20s uh, or even older in some cases. And they don't have those kind of core familiarities or core understandings of how these systems work, which really puts them up um, in a disadvantage, uh, disadvantageous position when they're looking at some of the peers that they're competing with. So we wanted to help work on addressing and identifying those gaps on a grassroots level, you know, working with youth, uh, especially to try to help get them better prepared to make that transition into adulthood and make that transition into whatever the next stages of their lives are. And so when Jade and I sat down to talk about the work we could do with Pemetewe, um, it was really important for both of us to build a model that was genuine and important and valuable to us. Make sure that the model that we were going to utilize for the business was something that we could both be passionate about and so the core foundations of the business that we designed was to incorporate um, not only key life skills, develop workshops uh, to, to reinforce those key life skills, to provide that grassroots support to Indigenous communities, Indigenous youth, but also do it in a way that's meaningful to us. So Pemetewe um, in Cree translates to come and play. And the reason we chose that name and that approach is because we want to utilize tabletop games kind of at the core level of everything we do. So, as I said, Pemetewe Together is the incorporated entity of the business. Um, it incorporates Pemetewe Consulting and Pemetewe Games. Um, we are Indigenous-owned, operated, and focused. And what we mean by Indigenous-focused is that supporting Indigenous communities will always be our priority. We have done work with some corporate partners. Um, we are pursuing work with some schools throughout Alberta, uh, but supporting the Treaty 6, 7, and 8 nations throughout Alberta will always be our number one priority. So, everything we do will always be uh, circling back to how can we serve those communities? How can we support those community members? On the consulting side of uh, the business, it's very much built on community-focused workshops. Again, our, our Indigenous youth life skill workshops, 
um, developing social skills, developing key life skills and competencies. Uh, we've also developed a host of other workshops that I'll get into in a few minutes. Um, and supporting the work we do there because we are, unfortunately, um, because of the way corporate options are in Alberta, I know that um, uh, Chief Cody um, had described their initiative as a social enterprise, which I know is a unique um, corporate structure in, in BC, which we don't have in Alberta. We did really struggle with, when we first uh, talked about the model for the business, we struggled with um, whether or not we should incorporate or whether we should incorporate as a nonprofit society. We ultimately decided that because we weren't entirely sure how we were going to push forward this model, we, we intentionally sidestepped this, the nonprofit model because we didn't want to get bogged down with the board of directors that maybe didn't fully understand the vision. So while we are an incorporated quote unquote for-profit incorporation, um, we do operate in the same mentality as a social enterprise, meaning that any extra revenue that we do bring in, should we ever uh, turn into a profitable business, uh, we will be reinvesting either in the community or in our own staff and team to be able to grow the, um, the, the impact that we can have in the communities we serve. Um, so to that end, we do business to business services as well. So we uh, built our whole model off of doing business to business support for uh, our First Nation clients and providing meaningful um, support for them. And then on the, uh, on the flip side of it, we have our kind of retail or consumer focused side of the business, which is Pimetoe Games. Um, it's a new initiative for us, although it is something we started uh, back in December of 2019. Um, the goal with that is to take everything we learned and all of the experience we've built on the Pimetoe consulting side with the workshops and use that to create a retail focused community gaming space here in Edmonton. So we'll be selling tabletop card games, board games, and role-playing games, as well as having a community-focused drop-in space. So we'll have a few private rooms that consumers can come in and utilize, and then also be doing different sorts of drop-in events. And we'll tie that into our workshop models as well. So in a little bit more detail, uh, what we do with the Medway Consulting. Um, again, like I said, community workshops, youth life skills are really part and parcel. They're really foundational to what we envisioned with the business when we first started. Um, but we also really want to lean on our experience as uh, education and employment specialists or, or um, subject matter experts and helping transition youth and, and even adults into whatever the next stage of education or employment they want to be into. Um, we've worked closely with the Treaty 8 Nations, uh, with the Treaty 8 Urban Office here, which is a CFS focused office supporting Treaty 8 um, urban members in Edmonton in providing some Indigenous culture camp work, um, helping understand the impacts of the treaties, helping understand the rights that they have as treaty members. Um, and we're also working on the corporate and uh, school side of things as well for non-Indigenous communities or non-Indigenous corporate structures in providing Indigenous allyship workshops. Because one of the things that we've seen is there's a lot of talk and a lot of lip service to the Truth and Reconciliation Report. And there's a lot of organizations that want to try to do something with TRC. And I think as Indigenous people, we've all seen examples of you know, a corporate entity or a school putting up you know, the seven grandfather teachings or implementing smudges into their morning rituals or whatever it is. And so what we want to do is, is try to drive home this idea that there is a big difference between Indigenous allyship and Indigenous appropriation. Incorporating Indigenous cultural practices into your business structure or into your school isn't, in, isn't always allyship. Sometimes it's just appropriation without understanding the significance of it. And you can't just pick and choose or cherry pick parts of Indigenous culture that you feel are meaningful. So that's the work we're trying to do with our Indigenous allyship workshops. On the consulting side of work, um, some of our specializations is social media and marketing support. So we've been working very closely with our Treaty 8 um, nations, uh, helping them put together uh, recorded media addresses from the Grand Chief of Treaty 8, um, helping manage some of their social media projects. Uh, and administrative, managerial, and HR consulting is kind of um, how we built the, the, the overall model. Uh, and then, of course, video conferencing support. Um, as a direct result of COVID-19, of course, a lot of organizations, a lot of communities um, who are already isolated, particularly in the Treaty 8 area, it, were having difficulty in staying connected with each other, uh, having difficulty in, you know, making those regular chief meetings. So we were really kind of uh, proactive in learning how to utilize Zoom, uh, both on the uh, video conferencing side of the webinar functionality and helping teach our clients how they could utilize that to stay better connected to their stakeholders, to their community members, and, you know, we're hoping that, especially in the, the nations that are more remote, we're hoping that even post COVID, a lot of those nations will utilize the technology that is available with video conferencing and with webinar functionality to stay better connected. Because I know one of the biggest challenges a lot of the chiefs face, um, either um, individually in the, the three treaty areas in, in 
Alberta, but even on the um, the AOTC or the Assembly of Treaty Chiefs when, when the Treaty 6, 7, and 8 Chiefs get together, is just the geographical challenges of getting all of the Chiefs together. And so utilizing that technology, that video conferencing support is a really easy way to remove some of those barriers and help move ideas forward. Uh, so one of the things that I've noticed just working alongside a lot of the nations is that they have fantastic ideas for self-governance and how they can better serve uh, their communities. Uh, but because they have to get together as a collaborative group, um, you know, ideas take a long time to move forward. So utilizing technology is a really big part of what we're trying to do to help our clients. On the game side of things, uh, it's a little bit more of a passion project for me, but I do think there's a lot of really good work we can do to help service our Indigenous uh, communities and our Indigenous community members. Um, for those of you that are familiar with Edmonton, we just signed a lease uh, on 118th Avenue and 94th Street, which is uh, also known as Alberta Avenue. The Alberta Avenue did just have um, a nice little uptick in uh, media presence because the Bear Clan, which I think initiated for, or, uh, originated from Manitoba, is working in that area. So it is an area that does have um, a higher population of Indigenous um, people living in it. It is a, a higher barrier area. It's a lower income neighborhood, um, unfortunately. So we chose that area specifically because it does have a lot of uh, opportunities for communities to get connected um, with the work that we're doing. Um, the reason why we feel games are so important, especially for Indigenous people, is because the concept of utilizing games and, and recreation as part of our, our cultural teachings has always been there as a history. It's obviously a little bit different in the model that we're looking at using more modern board games. Um, but also, you know, when you're looking at survivors of interge intergenerational trauma, uh, survivors of abuse, a lot of times those family members don't necessarily know how to interact with each other in a meaningful way. And they just need additional resources to, um, or some sort of buffer or barrier to, um, to interact with each other. So for us, when you put something like a board game or a card game or a family game that gives you a strict um, you know, set of rules on how you interact with the other people at the table, it gives you that kind of buffer, that tool to say, well, I may not know how to connect with you on a person to person level, but if we put this game in between us, we can use that to connect um, and connect through that. Um, so we're looking at having a fully stocked retail space. It'll have both mainstream and independent role-playing games. Uh, we are working with a lot of local creators here in Edmonton. Um, we're hoping that as we build that space for local creators, we'll be able to um, provide more access for Indigenous creators. Um, you know, we're going to carry hobbyist board games, which are a little bit heavier, uh, a little bit more time intensive, a little bit more serious, but also family-friendly card and party games. And again, with that that area that we're in, that community-focused area, we're hoping to reduce and remove some of the barriers for gaming, um, not just for Indigenous people, obviously, but for all marginalized groups, for, for individuals on the LGBTQ spectrum, for uh, other peoples of color. Um, you know, women is unfortunately still a minority in a lot of the gaming spaces, so we want to try to remove those barriers for everybody while bringing that Indigenous lens to the work that we're doing. And we'll be doing a lot of community events, drop-in special events um, that will tie to our workshop model as well. As we move forward with uh, new workshop models, a big part of what we want to utilize the community space for is for in-house events that we can tie to our workshop models. So as we're working with youth that are transitioning from their home communities to schools in Edmonton, uh, we want to provide you know Indigenous uh, youth nights or uh, student nights, things like that. Just a little timeline, just kind of over out, or outlining the uh, the work that Jade and I have done and how we kind of built Pemetaway together. Um, so we did start in 2017 just as independent contractors providing some direct support work for the Treaty 8 Urban Office. Um, that was very HR focused, developing job descriptions, hiring packages and org charts. Um, throughout 2018 and 2019, we provided ongoing support to the uh, PTO, Treaty 8 uh, First Nations of Alberta, as independent contractors working on some large and small scale uh, contracts. We were uh, kind of firsthand implement, or sorry, uh, instrumental in helping with the Treaty 6, 7, and 8 Youth Conference in 2018, which is a really great experience for us, and really kind of started inspiring some of the work that was also where the Treaty 8 Youth Council was born. So we were, um, you know, there for just kind of watching that grow uh, locally here in Alberta, which was fantastic. In 2019, we registered the trade name for Metaway Consulting, uh, again, based on those conversations that Jade and I had, inspired by the name, you know, come and play, uh, knowing that, you know, those games, those uh, tabletop games, that, that interaction piece was really going to be fundamental to the work that we wanted to do. Uh, December 2019 is when we launched our little kind of proof of concept for our retail space. We set up a little kind of private gaming area in our small 400 square foot office. Uh, we did start doing some drop-in games. We started building a little small community around us. 
um, just by happenstance, we managed to connect with a, a small group of Indigenous gamers that were just starting to explore role-playing games, um, and that was kind of led by Abraham Wu, um, who is a Treaty 4 member, um, moved from Saskatchewan to Alberta, and uh, Abraham has thankfully joined our team as an official uh, team member. Uh, he's been hugely instrumental in kind of helping guide some of the work that we're doing and expanded beyond Alberta, which was never really part of our model for Pemetaway. Uh, of course, COVID-19 started really hitting Alberta in March, so that's when we had to make that adapt adaptation. And, and, you know, being a consulting company first and foremost before we moved into retail, um, you know, being able to pivot and kind of switch our model on the fly was really important to us. And I think we did a really good job of uh, being prepared for those impacts. Um, it did delay a lot of our workshop work, unfortunately. We had some higher barrier schools uh, throughout the city that were really excited about bringing us in. We were offering pilot projects so we could start connecting with those youth to uh, start to help uh, deliver those models in a free capacity um, just so we could kind of refine our own uh, practices. But again, with COVID-19, uh, we pivoted. We started working on developing and implementing our workshops online, which has been uh, fairly successful. Um, you know, there is a little bit of Zoom burnout with a lot of youth transitioning to school. So the workshop model has been a little bit slower because of the pandemic than we'd like, but we're ready to continue to move, in, uh, move forward with that uh, online model. And then in July of, of this year is when we formally incorporated Pemetaway together, uh, which again translated would be come and play together, which we really liked as, a, as an overall banner for the business. So that Pemetaway Games and Pemetaway Consulting kind of roll all together under that incorporated entity. November 2020 is when we signed our lease uh, into our retail operations. We've actually officially started renovations. We're hoping on doing a soft opening in January. Uh, we're going to be inviting both the Treaty 6 and Treaty 8 Grand Chiefs. Treaty 6, obviously, because we are operating in Treaty 6 territory here in Edmonton. Um, and then we're going to be inviting the Treaty 8 Grand Chief just because of the history and the work that we've done with Treaty 8. They've been hugely supportive and, and instrumental in helping us grow our business in a way that's meaningful to both us and to their community members. Um, we're also going to be inviting the mayor, um, and uh, we're very proud to have Janice Irwin as our MLA. Um, for those of you that follow Alberta politics, she's a, a, a MLA NDP member um, who is very supportive of businesses in her community. Um, so we're really excited to kind of have some of those individuals that we think really help encapsulate the work that we're doing both um, as an Indigenous business and as, and as a business that really actively wants to make gaming a more inclusive and welcoming space. Going into 2021, it's not on the timeline because it's still uh, we're still working on it, but we are looking at launching a podcast um, just as part of our marketing uh, support tools. We'll be doing a, a gaming focused podcast talking about the work that we're doing as gamers, um, both at the space and how we can support um, uh, other creators. Um, we've been talking to um, a YouTube series, a new YouTube series, uh, Cavre, um, who are a same sex couple here in Edmonton that have started doing uh, video game, uh, sorry, board game uh, vlogs and videos. Um, as well as a couple other independent creators. So again, we want to create the space as a as a really um, welcoming community space where everybody can come in and talk about games and, and share that passion. And so just to close it out, um, the reasons why we do this work, um, first and foremost, we want to be able to support Indigenous people throughout Alberta. We want to be able to make the lives of our Indigenous communities better, our Indigenous community members better. We're always going to be a community-based uh, organization. Um, I've really kind of been able to articulate better with some of the community outreach we've been doing to uh, some of the creators and you know talking to uh, kind of addressing what chief cody brought up earlier about the, the social enterprise it's a people first business for us taking care of our staff taking care of our community members taking care of our, our partners is really first and foremost we want to remove barriers to gaming for marginalized groups through both our workshops and through our retail space and we want to be able to give an opportunity to partner and expand the reach for local creators um, and a big thing i didn't really talk about it a lot but we find that Indigenous representation in tabletop gaming is so limited and the most we see when it comes to representation is from a very colonized lens. It's always Indigenous people as a backdrop or, um, you know, Turtle Island as a, as a place where colonizers came and, and, and interacted with the land. And we, you know, Indigenous people just happen to be there as a backdrop. So what we'd love to do long term uh, with our gaming side of things is provide a forum and pro provide support and logistics to uh, give more Indigenous creators an opportunity to see the representation. It doesn't have to exclusively be Indigenous games, tabletop games. It can be comics. It can be books. We'd love to just be able to support more Indigenous creators in the work that they're doing and create a space where we can highlight and really uh, amplify their voices. And then last uh, for us as well, and, and it's really been indicative in the model and how we've hired, is providing opportunity and, and uh, growth growth and employment opportunities for Indigenous uh, people that we've, we've interacted with throughout our professional careers. We 
love working with Rupert's Land Institute and the uh, OTNL Employment and Training to provide summer student opportunities to give uh, Indigenous youth a, an opportunity to work in an environment that we think is really supportive. Um, you know, we, we tend to, the reason, the reason I use the title team lead and, and Jade uses the title workshop coordinator is because we want it to be the antithesis of that, you know, colonizer. Um, and I, I don't love that word because it does have a, a, a lot of political um, uh, em emphasis behind it. But, you know, that corporate structure of, you know, the hierarchy, the top down, we don't want to be managers. We don't want to be lead. We want to be leaders, but we don't want to be managers. I don't, it makes me extremely uncomfortable that anybody on the team refers to me as a boss. I want everyone in our organization to be equal, and I want us to all work together towards the common goal of these list of things that we're trying to do. So, um, yeah, that's basically it. Awesome. I um, think what you're doing is, is, is quite incredible and incredibly interesting, and also just an innovative medium for uh, communicating with youth as well as, um, like you said, the, the corporate allies. Um, I've, I've got two really cool questions and I can't decide which one I want to ask you first, but um, I was curious how you, as a gamer and also as a creator, how you personally work to combat Indigenous stereotypes in gaming? Um, so what I would say is, I think, it, and I think maybe I won't speak for any of the other presenters because I don't know anyone personally, but I think as an Indigenous professional, just in general, I think the biggest way to combat stereotypes is to just be positive, be encouraging, and just be visible. Be visible in the community space, um, be visible in community events, in gaming conventions, be visible and open about your Indigenous heritage, um, you know, and, and just let people see you and let people know like yes i am an indigenous person whatever you may think whatever your vision of, is, of an indigenous person might be that's not who i am and you know maybe you need to to recognize and check those stereotypes uh, beyond that like i said long term we'd love to support more, more creators and give them a platform and a venue to be able to highlight the work that they're doing um unrelated or tangentially related because we're not looking to expand into comics but there is an indigenous comic um artist right now in edmonton who's just been uh, signed by Marvel and is, is doing uh, illustrations for a, an Indigenous focused com uh, comic. So we'd love to see more stories like that, um, you know, more focus on the gaming side of things because it's like for our purposes, but that's really what we want to do is just be more visible in those spaces and combat it directly. Yeah, if I can find the link for that, um, that Marvel comic, uh, hero that's coming out. I think that's a great story here. Uh, just quickly, another question for you then is you've got the gaming uh, um, stream of things side of things. I was curious if you've ever considered innovating some of the tabletop game tools into a digital instruction tool that you can potentially license and offer to some of those corporate allies to help them um, improve some of their internal training for their employees. Yeah, so I mentioned Abraham earlier. And so one of the things that we really try to do is empower our team. And so Abraham's been working um, kind of diligently in the background, in addition to more of the front facing work he does, to work on developing some Indigenous created tools that will incorporate some of those teachings into a more game structure that we can market and, and utilize. Um, beyond that, it's it's more focused towards educators, uh, library schools. But one of the things that we are doing as well is trying to put together uh, curated curriculum based lists of games that we think have a lot of uh, value in an educational um, setting and then having um, having that list and, and being that kind of direct pass through because, you know, again, we've worked with uh, First Nation communities that want to bring games into their their nations. and. You know, one of the things when we talk about reducing barriers for access to gaming, if anyone's ever been to a, a comic or a hobby store, it can be a very overwhelming experience to walk in and not even know where to start. Um, just a quick little anecdotal story. I have a cousin who's about eight years younger than me, and she reached out to me about a year ago. Her and her friends had decided they wanted to try Dungeons and Dragons, had managed to get their hands on, on a little starter set. Um, and had no idea what to do. So she called me and she's like, can you please just schedule a quick time for to do a, a video conferencing call and teach us how to play? 
so I held a little impromptu one hour kind of overview session teaching them the basics of it and so I think there's so much value to incorporating games in an educational environment but you know most educators or most librarians they, they don't even necessarily know where to start and you are seeing a big push to have Dungeons and Dragons in the classrooms or in the libraries which is a huge push in the right direction but I think that you need a little bit of guidance and so to that end we do have somebody on our staff that does have a background in education um, Andrea, who is our curriculum coordinator, and that's kind of her whole role is looking at the games that we bring in on the uh, on the retail side and say, which of these can be correlated and tied into an educational environment? And more importantly, how can we um, provide support to educators to say, this is how you utilize these games? Because yes, we offer the workshops and we're happy to come in and do the workshops. But one of the things that we never want to do is create a dependency on our First Nation partners or education partners or library and partners and say, you must bring us in. We don't want to be gatekeepers towards this stuff. We want to make sure that we're removing those gates. So, yes, we'll do the workshops. We'll come in and teach the students or teach the youth. But we also want to empower the communities to do it themselves so they don't have to keep coming back to us every time. Utilize this as much as you want. But it's the same approach we've always taken on the business to business services. And maybe it's a little bit, you know, self-sabotaging to say, hey, only use this as much as you need to and try to empower our clients and our communities to do the work themselves. But at the end of the day, I've seen so many predatory uh, businesses that take advantage of first nation communities that I want to, you know, overcorrect on the other side and say, use this only until it makes sense and let us empower you to do as much of this work as you can so that we can move on to the next set of clients and empower them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you make a couple of really good points there around um, striking a balance between someone that does run a business and, and wanting to do good in the community, but not like Lucy trying to not, you know, be the one doing it all the time and building that that dependency on you um, after after you've offered that service. So, um yeah, that's awesome. So thank you so much for, for sharing your story tonight. I think um, I think it's something that's really interesting. And like I said, it is an incredible medium for communicating to a variety of, of, of people out there and, um, and stakeholders. So Colin, over to you. All right. Well, if we could, if all of our speakers tonight, all five of you can turn on your cameras. I see David is kind of coming and going with the internet <laughs> connection he has, because we do want to take a screenshot here that we can, of course, use for a social media post here. And also to thank you all for participating tonight. And Nicole, I do want you to finish the show this evening, but I do want to express my gratitude for the effort that everyone has made here. The just the knowledge sharing and the learnings that you've passed along. I, for, for me, just to listen and to learn and to become more accepting. And it's, it's, it's just, well, I'm a little overwhelmed right now. I, I, I just really appreciate all the effort that, that you are making. So I really hope that what we're doing here with Startup Vancouver and Startup Canada across the country and the great thing is we had three provinces represented here today with rural and urban entrepreneurs, younger and older entrepreneurs, women and men entrepreneurs. So we're having that diversity flourishing and showing itself there. So we've had Saskatchewan, Alberta and British Columbia represent here. And as we do here with Can Startup Stories and the reason we have Can in there is we'd like to make sure that this is showing entrepreneurship through the lens of all of Canada. So we do that one uh, one event at a time here. So again, I want to express my gratitude and my thanks to you all for participating this evening here. Oh, I see David's trying real hard here to get to get on here. I got to take a, <laughs> we'll see if he does or not. But in the meantime, I'm going to take a screenshot of all of us, and uh, maybe David will will pop on here. He can, he can come. But uh, so we don't have a need on. Oh, there's there he is. I don't know if Anita is able to pop on or not but I'm not sure if that's the case. But I'm gonna turn it over, Nicole, to you. And thank you again for, for, for hosting tonight and being the MC. You've been fabulous. And I really appreciate the effort that you've made in preparing and taking the time to do this tonight. So for closing tonight, Nicole, I wanna turn it over to you. Sure, so thank you, Colin. <clears throat> um, so to close off this evening, I just wanna say, Thanks to all of our speakers uh, and our supporters for their courage to come online and share their incredible stories. 
um, this new age of virtual events and virtual speaking can feel really unnatural. And especially for a lot of indigenous peoples, we really uh, thrive off in-person interaction. And I acknowledge it's not the preferred way for us to meet, but I just wanna raise my hands in thanks and say miigwech, um, which is thank you. And I also wanna acknowledge that it's so incredibly important as indigenous entrepreneurs and leaders that we share our stories and get the word out about the role we're playing in amplifying um, the indigenous economy and, and the diversity of our economy and, and the work that you are all doing. Uh, I want to acknowledge the work that Startup Vancouver and Futurepreneur and Van City are doing to amplify the voices of Indigenous entrepreneurs and more specifically uh, allowing us to have space to share our stories and, and also show our youth all the great ways that we are all collectively working to transform our economy and our respective communities. Um, and with that, that was all I wanted to add. And so I just wanna thank everyone for, for joining us this evening, sharing their stories, their patience with our variety of telecommunication capabilities across Canada. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna hold that to the federal government that they make those improvements hopefully sooner than they promised. And I just hope everyone has a safe and lovely evening. Thanks, everyone. Sorry everybody. about my camera issues. Thank you. Bye-bye, right. everybody. Bye. Bye.